Dr. Nurul Husna Mod Shukri is a senior lecturer at the University of Putra, Malaysia. Um, and she is a rising star in the field of behavioral biology of lactation uh, without any question. Um, she's in the Department of Nutrition and Dietetics um, after uh, extensive training within uh, the fields of nutrition. So she earned her PhD in infant nutrition at the University College London um, in the Institute of Child Health uh, under the mentorship of uh, Jonathan Wells, um, a visionary leader within uh, the field of evolutionary medicine and infant development. She earned her Master's of Science in Human Nutrition at Massey University in New Zealand. And she also earned first class honors in her Bachelor of Food Science and Nutrition at the University of Malaysia in Sabah. And I, I really want to emphasize the ways in which uh, Dr. Shukri is just an incredible early career scholar. She has published uh, numerous publications in leading journals uh, from maternal and child nutrition to BMC medicine to breastfeeding medicine, but she really epitomizes, I think, an amazing model for uh, taking evolutionary theory and first principles of adaptations in mother infant dynamics and applying that in a clinical setting. So she has and is in the process of conducting numerous intervention studies um, in clinical populations. These are pre-registered trials or pre-registered methodologies and, uh, and then conducts just you know, pioneering work to help support mothers and babies um, and, and toward greater public health in general. And her work that's ongoing within Malaysia um, just has such broad applications um, for maternal and child health globally. So um, I'm so thankful for Dr. Shukri's uh, willingness to prepare this presentation specifically for our audience um, during her peak teaching term. And um, please, everyone, join me in welcoming this presentation today uh, by Dr. Nurul Shukri. Hi, hello. I'm Nurul from University of Putra, Malaysia. I hope everyone is safe and in good health. So first of all, I would like to thank to Professor Hine for inviting me to give talk to this webinar series. So first, let me share my slide. I hope you can see my slide now. Okay, so the topic that I'm going to talk is the breastfeeding tug of war, or in other words, is the parent or spring conflict during breastfeeding. Um, this including um, the variation in lactation strategies to reach optimum benefits for both mother and infants. Here is my outline of presentation. I will first um, present about the public health perspective of breastfeeding, and then later we explore lactation in terms of the anthropological and evolutionary perspective of, of lactation. Uh, this including tug of war and mother infant signaling, and which lead to the mom study trial. Um, that I did during the doctorate study. Okay, so all of us know that breastfeeding is very important for both mother and infants. Uh, breastfeeding uh, improves health and development for children as it reduces the risk of infections. Um, also, long-term benefits, it reduces the risk of overweight and obesity and other chronic diseases um, later on. And for mothers, it reduces the risk of uh, ovarian as well as breast cancers. So uh, if, in, if improving the breastfeeding rates in general, it can improve both mother and infant uh, health and development. And this also lead to the uh, better cognitive uh, development in children, better productivity as well as economy, because breastfeeding reduces the risk of mortality and mobility. So it reduces the health burdens and, it, and, and better for economy. WHO has also recommended mothers to practice exclusive breastfeeding up to six months and continue up to two years alongside with complementary feeding. And during this pandemic era, the pandemic COVID-19, mothers infected with virus also uh, is recommended to breastfeed or continue breastfeeding their infants uh, with preventive measures. This because the benefits is outweigh the risk in terms of the breastfeeding benefit itself. So let's see um, the global rates of breastfeeding. So overall, um, the, the global rates of breastfeeding is still below the target levels. As you can see uh, here, the first and second bar, um, 
you can see here less than half of the populations, around 40% of babies actually uh, breastfed within the first hour after birth as well as um, the first six months as we see breastfeeding. So it is far below the target levels to achieve 70% for global um, for global uh, aim to uh, in terms of breastfeeding rates. So despite loss of initiatives uh, or supports and approaches, why the compliance to breastfeeding, um, why the compliance to breastfeed is still very far low beyond targets? One of the main factors that we can think is maybe due to the breastfeeding process itself is less understood or the understanding of the lactation process and the expectation sometimes is, is also uh, different than the reality in terms, of, in terms of the breastfeeding journey. For example, it is common for people to think that breastfeeding is a one-way journey or is a one-way uh, directive process, like mother is the driver and the infant is just the receiver. And it's also common for people to think that breastfeeding is, is purely instinct. But if we, for example, if we look beyond human, uh, our closest relative, like a chimpanzee, the female chimpanzee also uh, has to see other female nursing in terms of for them to learn and also to practice nursing for the babies. So um, all in all, breastfeeding is really a two-way uh, communication and negotiation between the mother and infant is a dynamic process. So in that case, tension is expected and conflict could also occur between the mother and infants. Which, which I will explain later as well in terms of the conflict. So um, our, our team has done recently to see the, uh, the pain and difficulties during breastfeedings. And we found that more than half of the populations experiencing pain. Um, and also this pain also increased uh, from the first day to the first week. And it's consistent in many other studies where they found uh, still a higher portion um, proportion of the mothers in many study populations uh, found that the mothers experiencing uh, pains and problems and difficulties. Okay, so um, talking about that, it leads to understanding the process of breastfeeding itself or the lactation itself because um, lactation or breastfeeding, it is a very dynamic process. Uh, for example, like in humans, we can also see the signaling occurs between mother and infants. So in general, we can categorize the mother-infant signaling into two, uh, broadly into uh, first, the psycho psychosocial uh, signaling, where it, it occurs among all mothers and infants, regardless of feeding methods. Um, this including um, um, the maternal uh, aspects and infant aspects, all these mother-infant interaction occurs um, during breastfeeding or during during the first two years after birth. But what's more interesting in terms of signaling is during breastfeeding uh, or the physiological aspect of signaling, which is via breast milk, because infants may signal to mothers via uh, uh, by vocalizations or crying or demanding for feed. And the way mother responds may affect milk volume or milk intake as well as may also alter the breast milk component itself. And the signaling is also um, interesting when we look into the non-nutritive component or bioactive factors as well, because um, a growing evidence have shown that these bioactive factors could also shape infant behavior. So uh, this also involve uh, not more on, this also um, show us that Breastfeeding is not just for food or for medicine, maybe for preterm infants, but it is also um, for signal. So when we talk about breastfeeding as signal, um, it is interesting to see that, to know that um, there's a lot beyond nutrients, there's lots of other uh, interesting component in breast milk, such as genetic material, uh, like microRNA, or various hormones, uh, leptin, ghrelin, or cortisols, or opiates, or enzymes, and many other active molecules. And um, the mechanistics and the function of these bioactive molecules are yet to explore, uh, because it is still less understood in humans and also largely unexplored. So 
uh, in terms of evolutionary perspective, uh, milk itself as well is the earliest uh, mechanism through which mothers signal biochemically um, to their offspring. So growing evidence has also suggested that milk, especially hormones such as cortisol uh, or lactate and ghrelin, influence the behavioral, and this can be translated in terms of understanding how the maternal um, as, well, as well as environments as well as infant factors correlate to each other and breast milk as the mediator of this signaling. Okay, so it is clear that from the public health perspective, breastfeeding is a valuable investment for human capital development. And for evolutionary perspective, uh, lactation could represent as a maternal investment um, through which the mother can promote her genetic uh, fitness by increasing the quality of the offspring through breast milk. So the maternal investment uh, strategy for her reprodu reproductive success uh, is very critical because the cost of reproduction itself is energetically demanding. In other words, um, lactation is expensive in terms of the cost of energy and time and efforts. So in human, for example, the, the energy cost for breastfeeding is higher than gestation and it requires in additional for about 500 to 700 kilogram a kilocalorie uh, per day for total daily requirement of a mother, of the uh, nursing mother. And these uh, energetic costs um, is mainly determined by the milk energy density or the composition or the volume of the milk. And it may differ uh, across populations or, or across time and stages of lactation. Okay, so um, according to the life history theory, within the environment constraints that trade-off occurs, um, trade-off energy occurs, right? Between life functions, for example, uh, maintenance, reproduction, growth, immune, immunity. Um, so if in the context of the female um, reproductive um, efforts, in particular pregnancy and lactations, so the use of resources or maternal capital are very high because a uh, mother has to face multiple trade-offs uh, in allocating her energy. For example, in allocating energy for her life functions as intra-individual trade-off and also subsequent for her offspring, intergenerational uh, trade-off. So um, the two main trade-offs that a mother has to face is first between the current offspring as well as the future reproduction, the future sibling of the current offspring. So basically the quantity and the quality of the offspring. Um, and also um, thinking at the mother perspective, uh, the mother actually is equally related to all of her offspring. Um, and um, it, as each offspring carries half of her gene, 50% of her genes, whereas for the infants, um, it carries also 50% of her full sibling and 25% of her half siblings. So basically mothers will invest for her current offspring at a certain cost in terms of energy um, and invest equally to each current and future offspring as long as the offspring will be fit to survive and reprodu reproduce in the future. So at the same time, uh, each offspring gain to a lesser degree than the mother uh, from the fitness of his siblings. So the mother would also maximize her fitness by weaning the offspring earlier, yeah, and also regaining her fertility and producing for the next offspring because this will lead to her reproductive success. Well, on the other hand, in terms of um, um, the offspring, they would maximize its fitness by prolonging lactations, uh, demanding uh, high demand high maternal investments, um, so maybe a, a, a longer duration of lactation or more frequent lactations, they demand more than what they needed. So lactation actually should not be regarded as a one-way process, but rather two-way negotiation between the mat I mean negotiation over the maternal resources. So at the same time, so here what we can say that tension is expected is expected. Um, and um, this may also lead to the um, uh, underlying 
some of the common encountered problems related to breastfeeding or perceived as a problem, for example, in terms of infant behavior, such as difficult temperament or fussiness or crying. So uh, in terms of evolutionary perspective, um, investment of very high energy to maximize the fitness of the current offspring can actually probably uh, result in fewer future offspring for the mother. So because of the less of maternal genes inherited uh, and passed to the future generations. So mothers may restrict her resources and invest it um, equally for her current and future offspring because um, she wants to benefit her genes. So as we can see, the infant will demand more than needed and this is also described by the Travers theory. So as I described just now, all of this is basically describing the tug of war during breastfeeding or parent offspring conflict. So looking at the anthropological perspective uh, during breastfeeding, uh, infants, infants demands um, by showing their behavior, uh, maybe high vocalizations or non-nutritive sucklings, and the mother may respond by either restricting or allowing her nipple access, and this eventually affects the, the milk intake, as I said just now, in terms of the breastfeeding um, signaling between mother and infants. So there are maybe three possible ways of signaling, I would say, between the mother and infants. So um, basically, the first mother might assume that um, they will respond to infant signal by increasing milk supply. Uh, but uh, secondly, um, that was regarding the milk intake. But secondly, regarding the macronutrient composition, composition itself, um, mother uh, may also, um, the, the, the milk that mother produces is not um, constant. It is uh, changing in terms of its compositions. So this can be illustrated by the verifying of fat content. Because we can know, because we can see that actually in breast milk, there is a, the fat content changes within a feed, and maybe this is also one of the way um, that could also influence the satiety um, or the feeding regulations, appetite regulation of the infants in long term through the process of the verifying of the component in breast milk itself. Uh, so the third way, um, as I said as well just now, reflecting to the mother infant signaling just now, in terms of the non-nutritive component or bioactive components. Uh, so this is uh, interesting where there's possibility of certain component in breast milk could also uh, influence infant's uh, behavior or uh, the way infants um, feed uh, certain components such as opiates, um, or certain in uh, may manipulate infant behavior. So these all of these interaction is still less understood and need to explore more. Um, so back to the um, mother infant signaling, uh, it is interesting to know actually who are actually um, more in control in provisioning uh, the energies, yeah? Um, as well as uh, it is interesting to know, to understand um, the potential conflicts between mother and infant because um, this could be a key to understand how parent offspring co-adaptations evolve in humans. And um, for before we move on um, regarding the topic of talk of war, it is also interesting to acknowledge uh, the 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 factors uh, that could also influence the mother-infant signaling. So I would like to emphasize on in terms of the maternal psychological distress, uh, because lots of literature has shown, review has shown that postpartum distress could influence the duration of breastfeeding or the continuity of breastfeeding, and it can also interfere with breastfeeding, um, with successful breastfeeding. Um, in terms of anthropological perspective, postpartum distress may also raise the tension of tug of war. As I showed just now in terms of the tug of war, at these points, we don't know whether we can uh, make it mutually beneficial for both parties by reducing the tensions. 
and who is more in control and is there any uh, intervention or uh, approach or modifying factors that can be um, I mean more many factors that can that we can intervene in terms of improving the breastfeeding um, outcomes. Okay, so back to the uh, psychological distress, um, study have shown that maternal psychological distress could affect the dysregulation of hormones, which eventually could affect the breastfeeding outcomes. And it is important um, to reduce this, to reduce or prevent this uh, psychological distress symptoms and by giving relaxation therapy or do some intervention perhaps it can um, provide a better uh, breastfeeding outcomes for both mother and infants so what we did actually we um, did a literature a systematic review to see whether relaxation therapy has been done in previous study and how is the effects for both mother and infants so we explore the usage and the efficacy of relaxation therapy um, and we conducted the review around um, 2016 and we found that actually from those study um, there's very low i mean there's not so many study has done to see the effects for both mother and infants so based on the review we found that only five articles um, is suitable to include into our review and three studies reported the primary outcomes related to breastfeeding in terms of volume, milk volume and compositions, while the two is more on the um, just the mountainous stress, not really looking into the outcomes of breast milk and none of the study looking on the outcomes uh, for infants. So overall, um, based from our review, we found that um, the strongest evidence um, was for the effects in increasing milk if the mothers receive relaxation therapy. And nevertheless, all studies included in the review has some limitations, um, either relating to the study designs or the sample collection procedure um, in terms of collecting breastfeed samples. So um, uh, this is the key messages um, and you can also view the full article here uh, if, you, if you're interested to explore more of our results. So basically, um, there are lots of potential issues to be explored in regards to the signaling between mother and infant during breastfeeding. Um, and as you can see, there's so many multi-factors and it is uh, difficult to use observational study because all are interrelated and most study actually uh, observational study design so we can't really understand which ones influence um, the other factors yeah so therefore we use experimental approach to investigate the causal relationship between the maternal psychological state which will we manipulate using a relaxation intervention prior um, a therapy and we want to see uh, the knock-on effects uh, to infants. So we want to see if we manipulate the psychological states, um, how will it uh, influence uh, the breastfeeding, um, the breast milk composition, as well as the infant behavior and growth. So in terms of the um, anthropological perspective, we investigate the anthropological aspects in terms of uh, focusing uh, on the tug of war mechanisms to know um, uh, the energy provisionings uh, in the evolutionary conflict between the mother and infants. Okay, so here <clears throat> I'm presenting the um, our trial, which is the uh, experimental study to see the effects of breastfeeding relaxation therapy on maternal psychological state, milk compositions, infant behavior and growth. So we have a test that a mother that listen to the therapy, they are with less stress, more relaxed, and this also alter milk compositions and infant outcomes. So in our study, um, we recruited mothers during pregnancy and we follow up um, after birth, as well as um, at two, six and 12 weeks uh, postpartum. Um, and we uh, randomized them after birth. Um, around one week after birth. So this study was done in Selangor, Malaysia. It is uh, in a, uh, one of the uh, main city in Malaysia among preemie parents, mothers only. 
So in terms of intervention, we use a guided imagery recording, like a breastfeeding meditations. And we ask the mother to record in a logbook in terms of the frequency of listening to the therapy. And we encourage the mother to listen every day or every alternate day for the first two weeks after each home visit that we do. So we measure both uh, mother and infants in terms of the psychological state of the mother, the growth of the infants, the behavior, as well as we collected breast milk samples. And um, in this case, we collected four male and high milk to see the changes within a feed as well as across time point. So we also analyze our biological samples um, using MIRES analyzer to see the macronutrient component and also assay for certain hormones such as cortisol, leptin, and ghrelin. And the main primary outcome has been published uh, in AJC. And if you're interested, you can look um, the detail of the study um, in this paper. So here I'm presenting the, the main findings. So first, in terms of the psychological state, we found that mothers that listen to the therapy, they were less stressed um, in terms of the score of the stress. Um, so it is significantly lower at second and third time points for the realization groups. So it's effective. This realization is effective in reducing maternal stress. Um, we also so um, um, we also um, see some trends in terms of reducing anxiety and depression as well at later time points, but it was not significant. So in terms of um, infant behavior, it is also interesting to see that this realization therapy uh, show effects in terms of sleeping durations. So basically at baseline, there were no different in terms of sleeping duration, but at later time points, infants who receive uh, mothers, uh, infant of mothers that receive realization therapy uh, has a longer sleeping duration as well. So it is about 82 minutes in average longer than those in the control group. In terms of infant growth, um, we found that those babies in, in, in the intervention growth has significantly higher uh, growth or weight and BMI at later time point. And these actually show a close match uh, with the optimal growth of breastfed infants according to WHO, which is close to the uh, 50th centile or zero sex score. So this suggests that realization therapy allow the infants to come closer to the ideal growth pattern. And then um, in terms of breast milk intake, we also measured using the W-level water method, um, isotope measurements. And we found that um, after three months, babies in the realization group consume um, in average about 227 grams um, well, about eight ounces of milk, of more breast milk each day than infants in the control groups. Um, so it is interesting to see that uh, the effects is also on the milk intake as well. And uh, in terms of the milk composition, uh, we also see the effects of realization therapy. Where we found that here, let me guide you here, is if you can see the green, okay, the green a color here representing the control group and the green color, the realization groups. And here is the first visit, second visit, and third visits. And the data shows here is the four meal and high meal in each visit. So what we can see here, um, we found that there's a greater full high meal fat um, and also higher high meal fat in the intervention group. And also a greater increase from four meal to high meal in the intervention group as well. Uh, in terms of milk carbohydrate, we also found that at later time points, mothers of realization group reduce um, significantly higher for milk carbohydrate um, in the milk. Uh, but we didn't manage to see the difference between uh, the lactose and oligosaccharides because uh, the machine that we use um, analyzed the full total carbohydrate. And overall, across time point, we can see the greater overall full milk in terms of the carbohydrate levels. But in terms of protein, we don't we didn't find any significant difference between groups. And move on to hormones. Um, we found that um, those intervention group mothers produce um, um, I mean um, had a greater reduction in terms of the milk concentrations within a feed from four to high 
during the interventions, although we don't find different at later visits. So maybe this shows the short term effects of relaxation therapy during the home visit itself. In terms of the other hormones like uh, ghrelin in breast milk, we found uh, no different at baseline, but at the second visit, form of ghrelin was significantly higher in the intervention group. Uh, whereas uh, when we explore this data, we found that uh, ghrelin levels also, especially at later visits, is significantly associated with the sleeping and feeding durations. So this provides the potential um, uh, research to explore uh, the ghrelin um, hormone in breast milk as well as um, the relation with infant behavior. We also found the dose response effects. For example, the mother, um, the, the, the frequency in terms of the listening to the therapy was associated with the reduction or lower stress score, as well as longer sleeping durations and higher infant growth. So there's also a dose response effects. So overall, as you can see here in summary, um, the diagram here, although it looks simple in terms of uh, the mother infant signaling, when we put all our results together in terms of the maternal factors, infant factors, and breast milk factors, um, I would say that the relaxation therapy is uh, effective in reducing maternal stress. We also found the results in terms of uh, longer sleeping durations, and also the milk component and also growth of the infants. And uh, we also found the associations when we explore the data. For example, a longer sleeping duration is associated with a higher growth in infants and also certain temperaments and appetite traits has also shown a different uh, direction of association with infant growth. And overall, we suggested um, uh, some pathway as well a psychological pathway and physiological pathway. Psychological pathway could be explained, for example, if the mother relax, uh, maybe they have better sleeping durations. And in Malaysia or in Asia, it is common to go sleeping with the baby. So maybe this could, could also influence the longer duration of uh, sleeping among mothers who were relaxed. In terms of the physiological pathway, this could also be that when the mother is less stressed, this alters the milk compositions as well as the milk volume, which eventually uh, may um, influence the feeding regulation as well as the infant growth. And then um, if we explain in terms of the uh, anthropological perspective, um, the tug of war uh, during breastfeeding. So in our study, we aim to reduce tug of war and to make it mutually uh, beneficial for both parties. Because strength, stress use energy, crying also use energy. So if we can do some things to reduce both stress as well as uh, manipulate um, uh, in certain way, for example, mothers manipulate a certain component in breast milk that could also influence the way infant behave, could provide a better potential for breastfeeding success. So, if we see all the possible pathway here, um, I would say there's a biobehavioral pathway or energy divert diverting pathway. Uh, first, let's see if the tension is high during the tug of war. So if the tension is high, for example, mother, they are stressed, they use more energy. So the investments uh, in terms of the breastfeed itself is lower, and this can lead to less energy for growth. Um, same here, if the infant um, shows a higher vocalizations, demand more milk, and um, it can also create the less strong interaction between mother and infant, which eventually disrupt the breastfeeding process. So the provisioning of energy uh, in terms of from mother to infant could also be less, and eventually infants even grows up on as well. So if we uh, manipulates the maternal energy budget by giving the relaxation therapy, by reducing the stress of the mother. So when the mother is more relaxed, in other way, um, this could uh, provide more uh, capacity of energy for the mother to invest. Because, for example, if the mother is less stressed, they save more energy and lead to high investment in breast milk. And there's a capacity of extra energy for infant growth. 
In other way, um, we can also see the biobehavioral signaling pathway um, by assuming that certain component is in breast milk could be altered due to relaxation therapy. So for example, if the mother less stress, this alters certain component in breast milk, and this component may influence infant sleeping, and when infants sleep longer, for example, that we found in our study, so they have more energy to be used for growth, and so baby has more energy to reserve and eventually influence the growth. Um, another way also through better bonding or behavior uh, between the mother and infants um, could also be shown by the better co-sleeping and when co-sleeping can also reserve more energy and also provide an extra energy for growth. So in conclusion, um, from this finding, we could say that uh, when the mother are more relaxed due to relaxation therapy, uh, they have better efficiency in terms of milk ejection and alter milk composition and eventually uh, provide greater weight uh, gain for infants. Um, we also may see this finding, as I, I explained just now, in terms of anthropological perspective. So we manipulate psychological state, uh, manipulate or save energy budget, and reduce the tug of war tension between the mother and infants, and this push toward a positive um, energy balance, resulting in greater energy investment in milk production, and also higher infant weight in long term. Um, however, we have some limitation in our study because it predominantly, um, I would say the uh, predominantly Malay ethnicities as well as high high socioeconomic mothers when we doing uh, the study in the capital city. So it is important to look further into this aspect among mothers who were more stressed, um, especially those mothers of, of, of written babies or mothers that has infant that has been hospitalized due to any reason because they are more stressed. So they, they may use more energy diverting away from the investment in breast milk. Um, so here I'm sharing some ongoing study that has been done from our team. As I show you just now here, our team, uh, we have Sarah Deep and Jimmy Yu, they are currently doing the study to look the effects of realization therapy in other populations. Uh, so uh, first, um, there's a one study they have done to see the within subject comparison where they see that um, uh, with different relaxation therapy because we want to know from our from from mom study just now we want to know whether the effective of relaxation therapy is because of the 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 method itself the therapy itself or maybe there's also other factors that makes the mother relax in terms of the script of the relaxation therapy that empowers the mothers so in this study they see different relaxation therapy different meditations and they also use uh, a realization lighting so to see whether this also make the mother even more relaxed. And they found that actually um, the best or the most effective is actually the guided imagery recording, the one that I also use uh, during mom study trial. So Sarah is currently doing the study to see the effect of realization therapy among mothers of late preterm infants in, uh, in the UK. Uh, because mothers um, compared to late term, uh, compared to term infants, uh, preterm infants stay longer in hospitals. They require um, more um, care as well as um, more attention in terms of their medical, um, as as well as they suffer more um, difficulties and less likely to breastfeed as well. And also one of our team, uh, Jin Yu, uh, what she has done previously as well to see the different comparison of uh, relaxation therapy um, to see the effects in terms of the physical outcomes like heart rates, physiological outcomes like heart rates, blood pressure, temperature, and so on. And they've still found that relaxation meditation in terms of uh, imagery recording, the one that I use, is still the most effective method. So she is currently doing the study to see the effects of relaxation therapy um, not only for psychological state and infant growth, but also um, for gut microbiome, uh, which is interesting. This is going to be 
in our um, knowledge, this is going to be the first RCT actually to investigate the role of HMO microbiota in terms of mother infant signaling. So, um, why I'm, I'm, I'm showing the different studies in terms of different relaxation therapy? We can also think in terms of the relaxation strategy in human because um, human are able to use their own resources, capital, um, like uh, for example, modern stores, or maybe through social capital as well to protect their offspring as well as uh, themselves against uh, uncertainty in the environment. So to compensate with a high cost of lactation or as part of lactation strategy, um, mothers have a tendency to also increase the energy intake by you know, having adequate uh, nutritious food. For example, if we see in the in terms of cultural aspects in Asia, in many Asian countries, especially Southeast Asians, um, mothers usually have a special um, traditional diet, and this diet uh, usually aim to improve the maternal um, recovery after birth, as well as uh, some perceive to improve uh, or to increase the breast milk, um, uh, the breast milk volume. Um, so other than that, some also, also reduce the physical activities. So same in Southeast Asia, we also practice a, a, what we call it confinement uh, period or traditional confinement period where the mothers tend to uh, not move less, but not um, move around too much, like not going out so much outside home, but rather stay at home, relax, and someone taking care of the mothers as well as of the baby. So it's, so it's more like they have a social support uh, to, um, to help both the mother and babies to cope well during the first few months of postpartum periods. So um, besides supports, as I said just now, it is also important for the mothers to minimize the stress. That's also part of the lactation strategies. Um, and in terms of social aspects, it is also crucial for mothers to invest in social relationships during these reproductive periods. Um, as we can see, for example, elo parenting, someone's in the family members or non-family members could also take care of the baby. So this energy could be diverted or could be, um, so um, the mother could has more capacity of energy uh, coming from other resources in terms of caring or nursing the baby. Um, here I'm just uh, showing some photos of traditional confinement or practices. Uh, during postpartum periods. So basically, uh, so the first photo is basically the mothers having like a herb or bath, um, traditional herb bath and then steam sauna. Um, so some herbs appliance to the body as well. And the mother also received massages, special massages uh, during these periods. And these massages was perceived to improve uh, the breast milk volume as well, and also receive certain confinement diet. Um, some people will argue saying that this traditional confinement practice is not evidence based, so not so maybe it's not a good practice. But what I will say that actually the evidence is still less, so there's a huge potential to explore in these aspects. If we think in terms of the social aspects, so when the mother practicing this. Um, they receive um, this, uh, they receive care from others. At the same time, they can this can also make them more relaxed. Uh, so the most important is the practicing of these traditional confinement should not be too extreme in both way. For example, not too extreme following this. Um, for example, some others take it to extreme level where they don't move at all. They just stay in the house. So this. Uh, practice is uh, is of course not uh, recommended because uh, it's, it's eventually may not necessarily good for the health of the mother's psychological state as well. Um, and some take into the extreme level in terms of the diet, where some mothers practice taking a very limited amount um, of uh, diet because the main aim is to reduce weight. Uh, so if we take in between, for example, practicing um, in a 
in a good settings, in a nice environment and having a good proper diet, it could be beneficial for the mothers. So we don't know. So it is a huge um, um, gap to explore more on this. Okay, so to conclude, um, the main concept, I would, I would like to emphasize that lactation is dynamic and flexible process, uh, which is expected to differ between mother-infant diets and also across time. Uh, since physiological and ecological environments um, or factors could vary between human populations, so the likelihood that a one-size-fits-all approach will work for all mother-infant diets is counterintuitive uh, because it's differ between population and across time. So it is important to understand this. And um, here I provide um, some examples or um, actions or implication that can be done by researchers or policymakers and health professionals to improve this understanding. And uh, this information is also available in the paper, uh, in the full paper uh, from the future et al. Uh, and the second one is uh, also in terms of the understanding that tension is also expected during breastfeeding. And um, greater acknowledgement and maternal awareness of this expected tension could provide a different perspective on some common infant feeding issues for example, like colic, colic or, or crying uh, and so on. And perhaps it could provide a better creative approaches to solving these issues as well. And last one is the importance of learning. Um, for example, improving the social network is important for mothers. It's including uh, normalizing breastfeeding, improving the perception of all different aspects regarding breastfeeding and give early exposures because educating pregnant or breastfeeding women maybe could be could consider as a bit late for certain population hence it's important to educate way early and make it normalized um, so i um i would like to just show this meme i like to see that it shows that a different perspective um, or different layers of roles of societies and individual uh, in terms of the perception toward breastfeeding. So that read my presentation. Um, I thank to you for your attentions, and I would like to acknowledge that uh, my presentation here is inspired by both of my supervisors, uh, Professor Jonathan Wells and Mary Futrell, and also my research team in UCL as well as in UPM and also our collaborator in Slovenia. Thank you very much. Hi, Dr. Shukri. First of all, thanks for that, uh, that talk. That was excellent. I really enjoyed it. Um, I have lots of questions, but I'll, I'll, I'll keep it to two. <laughs> the one is, is there a lot of evidence of differences in stress globally, because I can imagine that there's a lot of differences in cultural practices in how maternal stress differs, right? So you were explaining in, in your uh, culture that the type of relief, at least for maternal stress there is. I think we can all agree that in the US, the maternal stress is probably quite high postpartum. I'm personally from the Netherlands, and in the Netherlands, every mother is assigned a personal nurse for the first 10 days. So there's like, there's a lot of variation. So I'm just curious, like, is there any data where they're measuring stress levels or even stress levels in the milk across these different geographical areas? Um, all right. Um, I think I've read one systematic review because I can't find the latest systematic review. Maybe there is, and um, I just don't, don't see it. Uh, what I found last time, the risk is different across country and I think it's around 17% worldwide of the mothers at that time uh, from the paper experiencing uh, stress or depression symptom during postnatal. And what I would like to emphasize that they found that the stress level increased from first month to the third month postpartum. So if we don't do anything, if we don't, uh, if the mothers, you know, um, having to stress chronically, it can lead to um, severe, severe conditions. So basically, 
it increased from early to later period. But I'm not sure like how much different between countries, but it seems like it's, deep, it's highly variable, I guess. If I can ask another question. Um, I'm just curious, so I know all your research is focused on, on mother's milk, right? Like breast milk, but I'm curious what the impact is of these relaxation therapies on mothers that feed artificial milk. So I would imagine based on the pathways that you show that there is some benefit, like, do you have a sense of like what relatively is that pathway, right? Like not breast milk specific and which ones are breast milk specific? Yeah. Um... We was thinking last time after the study, we think um, how exactly your question is. So we don't know what's the answer, but because for breastfeeding is so exciting, we can see the signal between mother and infant. But for formula feeding, we still have the signaling in terms of how mothers, you know, and babies communicate to each other. Uh, what we think is if the mother less stress, although she's not feeding the baby, but she's you know. Um, getting any sort of realization therapy, maybe she ha could have a, a better co-sleeping with the baby. Um, or not, sorry, not necessarily better co-sleeping, co -sleeping, but better uh, bonding with the baby. And in other way, perhaps um, uh, they can have a better signals outside the physiological part. So could it be beneficial. It's just that we can do more study on that. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> thank you for the questions. Thank you. Right. Um, Alexis, do you want to ask your question? Yeah, the one I typed into the chat. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so um, on one of the articles that was listed on page seven, it mentioned that breastfed babies are more temperamental than formula-fed babies. And I was hoping we could just elaborate on why that is, um, or if it's just an observation not scientifically supported. But I was wondering if it had anything to do with either nutritional differences or mother-child investment differences. Okay, um, so these studies, they found that mothers um, who formula, I mean, ba ma ba formula fat babies seem to have a lower temperament score compared to, form compared to breastfed babies. Um, we, we think there's also this possibility that uh, because mothers, they uh, breastfeeding mothers, they kind of, feel, uh, they kind of have a, um, more attention in terms of understanding baby signal they could also perceive this as higher temperament, but maybe it could be similar. That's one of the reason. Another one, this could possibly due to it is normal uh, for the baby to signal more because um, they receive much more from breastfeeding as well. Um, so in terms of that, I would say that um, there's not so much study regarding the temperament of the infants and comparing between breastfed or formula fed babies. Uh, but the possibility, the difference could be due to the signals and the understanding between mother and baby. Okay, thank yeah, you so much. Find difference, yeah. uh, and then, um, Mayana, do you want to ask your question? Mayana? Yeah, hi. Um, so my question was just about like, um, when it's still breast milk, but the mother's pumping, maybe they have a schedule where they're not able to breastfeed if the relaxation has the same benefit on like maybe the production of the breast milk or um, just like wondering how much of a difference that makes. Okay. Um, so when we did our, our study, we don't, um, at, the, at the beginning, we don't really you know, take into account what the express breast milk. So we found that when we did, uh, you know, the, the, the W level water method, the, the isotope measurements, with that method, it's kind of, um, uh, we, we, we found that when the mothers express milk, we couldn't, uh, uh, we couldn't estimate quite accurately in terms of milk production, actually, uh, because some mothers might give the express breast milk. So that sometimes don't really count into the measurements. So anyway, when we try to think about the composition of milk itself, of course, breast milk is the best and direct feeding is the best, but breast milk is still always the best. So um, we know that there's, there's a lot of bioactive chemical inside a milk. Um, it depends on to how much extent the mother has stored the milk. So if express fresh milk is still, they still has high um, functional bioactive chemical from the milk, but if it has frozen of, or uh, has been refrigerated, it depends to what, to, to how long it has been you know, stored. 
But uh, what I would like to emphasize is during direct feedings, uh, the baby receive, um, the, there is a variation in terms of the concentration of certain hormones compared to express milk as this most, um, you know, it's just, it's not changing across, I mean, within one feeding. So that's why when we did our study, we tried to look um, the concentration from four to high milk and we found it differs uh, where, for example, fat, is higher and then we can also see uh, ghrelin and leptin while ghrelin uh, in increase within one time and leptin reduce within one times and we know that it has something to do with um appetite regulation and at the same time i'm so interested with ghrelin now because we found it's highly associated with sleeping duration and because ghrelin maybe could have uh, many other functions because it produced in many parts of human um, organs uh, so it is, uh, it is a huge, I think it's a, will be a huge research gap to really look into all different kind of a function of this hormone and how does it change within a feed and if it changes within a feeding, uh, how much and to what extent it can affect infant behavior after that. So I guess direct feeding, maybe there will be so much uh, signaling between mother and baby, but, but still for express milk, it depends on how much it has been stored. And also another thing is uh, for express breast milk, um, this is also another gap that we don't really see um, how does the mother actually store you know, express milk, whether in the day or at night, because at night the mother's, the milk contains certain other hormones like melatonin, and in the day they contain cortisol, and all of these could also influence the way baby behave. Um, and melatonin has been found to be so high after 8 p.m., so um, I even recommend to mothers that uh, when I when I you know see them at the clinics, uh, to if if you may, if you really express your milk, try to you know try to give them the night's milk at night time or day milk during the daytime if it is possible. Just um, Bruce German from UC Davis has uh, a question, and, and so we're going to wrap up with his question. Um, Bruce, do you want to ask it, or do you want me to read from the 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 chat window? <laughs> I can ask, yeah, um, fascinating work, love the talk. Um, so, so if stress is driving milk composition down, um, there are a lot of things that also do that. In your studies where you looked at stress levels in the mothers, is there some way that, that something you could measure that we could identify in a clinical cohort, uh, these mothers are in fact stressed enough to see a difference in milk composition and, and part of that, that the differences we see are stress identifiable. Because uh, you measured a lot of stuff. You didn't indicate which ones were the best. I'd love to know. Oh. OK. Um, so yeah, we measured the uh, psychological stress using questionnaire. Um, and it was a validated questionnaire that has been used in Malaysia. Um, so that is one of the things that we use to see the differences between mothers um, in our RCT. At the same time, we measure cortisol hormones, but we can't assume that is the, the strong stress indicator because it is um, there's so much things that cortisol hormones um, has other function as well in terms of um, in term of um, allocating certain energy or, um, for macronutrients. Uh, so it is interesting if we can do lots of other things like um, Jinyu and Sarah studies. After that, they try to look on the uh, heart pulse, heart, heart rates, as well as temperature and blood pressure. And it seems interesting that it is different. I guess the strongest indicator, I, can't, I, I don't know um, which one is the strongest, um, but maybe combination to confirm which one, uh, whether the relaxation is effective would be good. All right, thank you. All right, okay, everyone, thank you so much for attending the talk. Students, please uh, stick around after a five minute break and let's do one, uh, another round of applause for uh, Dr. Shukri. Thank you so much. Thank you, everyone.